It was just another miserable Monday morning in the city. The rain drizzled like a broken showerhead, pooling in the gutters and dampening the spirits of anyone brave enough to step outside. My name is Alex Mercer, a detective with the city's homicide division. I've seen it all, or at least I thought I had, until that fateful day. I was nursing my third cup of coffee, staring at the cold case files scattered across my desk, when the door to the precinct burst open. In walked Officer Maria Gomez, slightly disheveled, her eyes frantic. Alex, you need to see this. Now. The urgency in her voice immediately caught my attention. I grabbed my trench coat, draped it over my shoulders and followed her to her desk. The monitor displayed live footage from a surveillance camera. What I saw made my stomach churn. Is this what I think it is? I asked, grimacing at the gruesome scene on the screen. Triple homicide. And get this, it happened less than two blocks from here. Chief wants us on it. I felt a shiver run down my spine. I'd seen my fair share of crime scenes, but something about this one hit different. Let's roll. Lights painting the walls of the narrow alley where the murders had occurred. The area was already cordoned off. Officers milled around, collecting evidence, snapping photos, trying to make sense of the horror before us. Detective Mercer, Officer Gomez over here, beckoned Chief Thompson. He looked at us both, the weight of responsibility heavy in his eyes. This is a high-profile case. The victims are Lisa McAllister, CEO of McAllister Tech, Congressman John Brown, and an unidentified male, probably in his early 20s. Shit, I muttered under my breath. Any witnesses? None, and the surveillance cameras were tampered with. Someone knew what they were doing, the chief said. I'm putting you both on the case. We need this solved and we need it solved fast. The mayor is breathing down my neck. We approach the bodies, three victims, laid out in a triangle, as if part of some morbid display. Each had a single gunshot wound to the head. Maria took out her notepad. No signs of struggle. This was an execution, but why? I knelt beside the youngest victim. He looked no older than my daughter would be in a few years. Poor kid probably didn't even see it coming. Maria's phone buzzed. She glanced at the screen. Lab results are in. The bullets match a Glock 17, and they found traces of chloroform on a cloth near the dumpster. I rose to my feet. Let's head back to the precinct. We've got work to do. Back at the precinct, the atmosphere was electric. The room buzzed with chatter and the clatter of keyboards. Detectives were working on their respective cases, but the triple homicide was the talk of the floor. I settled into my chair and skimmed through the preliminary autopsy reports. Time of death estimated between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., I muttered to myself, rifling through the pages. All three shot at close range. No evidence of sexual assault. No valuables missing. Maria sat across from me, her eyes glued to her screen. I've been trying to access the victim's phone records. It's a slow process. There's a lot of red tape to cut through. Anything on your end? Nothing that connects the three victims directly, I said. Lisa McAllister was a tech mogul, divorced, two kids. John Brown was a congressman, married with no kids. And the young guy? John Doe, until we can ID him. No one has come forward yet. My phone buzzed. A text from an anonymous number. You're not going to solve this case, Mercer. Drop it. I looked up at Maria. Did you just text me? She shook her head. Why? What's up? Someone just sent me a warning, telling me to drop the case. Maria's eyes widened. You think it's related to the murders? I don't know, but we've got a leak, or worse, someone on the inside who's involved. Three days had passed since the gruesome discovery, and we were no closer to catching the killer. My phone buzzed again, another anonymous text. Last chance, Mercer. I was on edge. The walls of the precinct felt like they were closing in. The pressure from up top was intensifying, and the media were having a field day. Maria burst into my office, breathless. We've got something. 
a potential witness, saw someone lurking near the alley around the time of the murders. Finally, a break, I said, relieved. What did they see? A man, medium build, in a hoodie and a baseball cap, parked near the scene. His car was a red 2019 Ford Mustang. The witness couldn't see the plate number, but he said the car had a broken tail light. Get the traffic cams pulled up, I instructed, my pulse quickening. Let's find that Mustang. Hours went by as we combed through the footage. Maria let out a triumphant yell. Found it! And you won't believe this! The car was caught near the residence of Congressman Brown earlier that night. I clenched my fists. Get the car's plate number and put out an APB. We need to find this guy. Maria's eyes met mine. We're getting closer, Alex. I can feel it. I nodded, but the anonymous texts weighed heavy on my mind. Who was trying to intimidate me? And what the fuck did they want? The APB had been out for hours, but there was no sign of the Red Mustang. Every patrol unit in the city was on high alert. The tension was palpable, like a live wire running through the precinct. Each time the phone rang, we jumped, hoping it was the break we so desperately needed. Finally, it came. A call from a patrol officer near the outskirts of the city. We've located the Red Mustang parked near an old warehouse on 5th and Main. It matches the description. Broken taillight, 2019 model. My heart raced. This could be it. The break we needed to crack this case wide open. Secure the area and wait for us. Don't engage unless necessary. We're on our way. Maria and I hopped into an unmarked car. Sirens blaring as we sped through the rain-soaked streets. As we neared the warehouse, I gripped my Glock, my fingers itching at the anticipation. We both knew the gravity of what we were walking into. The warehouse loomed ahead, its silhouette haunting in the dim light. We parked behind the patrol cars, their flashing lights casting eerie shadows on the building's crumbling facade. Stay sharp, I cautioned Maria as we approached the entrance, our guns drawn. We don't know what's waiting for us in there. With a swift kick, I burst through the door, my gun aimed forward. The warehouse was dark, save for the occasional flicker of a faulty light bulb. We moved cautiously, our footsteps echoing through the vast emptiness. Clear! Maria called out as we made our way through the first floor. Nothing. It was as if the place had been abandoned for years. Just when it seemed like another dead end, Maria's flashlight caught something. A makeshift workbench with maps, photographs, and what looked like a disassembled gun. I approached, my eyes widening as I took in the horror of it all. Photos of our three victims were pinned to a board, each marked with red ink in the shape of an X. Beside them, pictures of other individuals, including prominent city officials, and one of me. This is far from random. Maria uttered, her voice tinged with disbelief. This was all planned, and if we're interpreting this correctly, there are more targets. Yeah, I agreed, my thoughts racing. But we have another problem. Someone's been tracking me. And if my photo's on this board, I might not just be the hunter, I might also be the hunted. My phone vibrated. Another anonymous text. Too late, Mercer. The room went dark. We heard the screech of tires, the revving of an engine. Rushing outside, we saw the red Mustang speeding away, disappearing into the night. Shit. We were so close, yet so far. And the grim reality hit me. This was bigger than us. Bigger than anything we'd faced before. Our lives were in danger and time was running out. The air in the precinct was thick with disappointment and urgency. We'd been so close, yet the perpetrator slipped through our fingers like sand. To make matters worse, the fact that my photograph was among the potential targets shook everyone, especially Maria. The unspoken tension stretched between us like an invisible thread, and neither of us dared to cut it. Let's regroup, Maria said finally, breaking the silence as we returned to the office. We need to understand this person's motivations, his connections, and why you are on that list. Yeah, I sighed, 
sinking into my chair. It almost feels like a vendetta, but I can't think of any past cases that would lead to something like this. Hell, it's probably something we don't even know about yet. The precinct was quieter than usual. Eyes glanced at me, then away, a ballet of suspicion and sympathy. Being a target changed the equation. Could I even trust the people around me? I pushed the thoughts away. This was no time for paranoia. Or was it? Have you pulled the traffic cam footage around the time the Mustang sped off? I asked Maria, trying to regain focus. We have, but it's as if the car vanished into thin air, she answered, her frustration evident. Whoever this is, they're good, Alex. They're always one step ahead. The phone rang abruptly, shattering the room's tense silence. I picked it up, my hand slightly trembling. Detective Mercer speaking. Is your life falling apart yet? The voice was distorted, mechanical, but dripping with malicious satisfaction. My grip tightened around the phone. Who is this? Tick-tock, Mercer, the voice taunted before hanging up. Shaken, I placed the phone back on the receiver. It was him, or someone connected to him. They're playing games with us, Maria. This is more than just a murder case. It's psychological warfare. Maria leaned against her desk, her eyes filled with a mixture of fear and determination. Then let's play the game, Alex. But let's make sure we're the ones who win. I nodded, feeling a newfound resolve surging through me. Agreed. Let's start by revisiting past cases, especially those where the suspect or their family might have a reason to target me. It's a long shot, but we've got to start somewhere. As we delved into old files, retracing steps and questioning old conclusions, I couldn't shake off the feeling of an unseen crosshair aimed at the back of my head. Each moment that ticked away on the precinct's clock was a reminder that the next move in this deadly game was not going to be mine. Trust is a fragile thing, and once broken it turns every certainty into a question mark. The coming days were going to test the boundaries of trust, not just in the justice system, but also in the people I'd come to rely on. But the question remained, how do you win a game when you don't even know the rules? Days bled into nights, a blur of faces, case files, and the persistent tick-tock of the clock that seemed to mock us from the precinct wall. We'd combed through every cold case, every unsolved mystery, and every suspect or family member with a vendetta. Yet, the connection, the missing puzzle piece, that would make the image complete, eluded us. I was at home trying to catch some sleep when the call came in. My eyes darted to the clock, 2.34 a.m. Mercer, it's Maria. Her voice was tinged with urgency, a sharp contrast to the stillness of the night. We've got another body. Same M.O., and you're not going to like this. It's Police Commissioner Hughes. My heart sank. I'm on my way. The crime scene was abuzz when I arrived. Forensic units scoured the area, snapping photographs and collecting evidence. The commissioner's body lay sprawled out on the asphalt, a gunshot wound to the head. It was a message, an escalation. The killer was inching closer to home, tightening the noose around us. Any witnesses? I asked, pulling on a pair of latex gloves as I approached Maria. None, but we've got something else, she said, leading me to the commissioner's car. On the dashboard was a stack of photographs, pictures of us, the precinct, and all the victims thus far. And at the top of the pile was a photo of me, with a red X slashed across it. What the fuck is going on? Maria's hands trembled slightly as she held the photos. I don't know, I admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. But whoever this is, they're coming for us next. As we returned to the precinct, the reality of our situation began to set in. If the commissioner wasn't safe, then who was? Doubt had crept in, filling the gaps between colleagues and friends, superiors and subordinates. Back at my desk, I found a sealed envelope. Inside was a single photograph, a picture of Maria and me, taken from a distance, unaware and vulnerable. Scrawled on the back were the words, 
Who can you trust? My eyes darted around the room. Maria was caught in a discussion with the captain. Other officers were buried in their work. Phones pinned between shoulders and ears, fingers dancing across keyboards. Could one of them be the insider? The person who'd been feeding our every move to the killer? My phone buzzed. Another anonymous message. Look around, Mercer. Your enemy is closer than you think. This was no longer just a manhunt. It was a battle for survival. The lines between ally and enemy had blurred, redrawn in shades of gray. I was standing on a precipice, staring down into an abyss of betrayals and hidden agendas. One false step, one misplaced trust, and I would plunge into darkness, taking Maria and possibly others with me. I had to tread carefully, each move calculated, each trust weighed. Because now it wasn't just about catching a killer, it was about unmasking an enemy hidden in plain sight. The precinct had turned into a pressure cooker, each officer looking over their shoulder as whispers of conspiracy floated through the air. I couldn't even trust my own gut anymore. The closer we got, the more tangled the web seemed to become. It was as if we were tracing a maze with no exit, a labyrinth designed to trap us within its walls. Emergency meeting in the conference room. Everyone now, Captain Thompson barked, his face flushed with a mixture of anger and anxiety. We shuffled into the room, its atmosphere thick with suspicion. The captain stood at the head of the long table, flanked by an internal affairs officer. We have reason to believe there may be a leak in this precinct, Captain Thompson began, his eyes scanning the room. Given the sensitive nature of this case and the direct threats against officers, we are implementing new security protocols effective immediately. Everyone will be under scrutiny until we catch this bastard. Heads nodded, eyes darting, each of us sizing up the other. Maria caught my eye from across the room. Her face was a mask, but her eyes flickered with concern. We were both thinking the same thing. The betrayal could be coming from anyone, anywhere. After the meeting dispersed, Maria pulled me aside. Alex, we need to talk. Yeah, we do, I agreed, leading her to a secluded corner of the precinct. Maria, at this point, anyone could be a suspect. We need to figure out a way to communicate that's off the grid, something that can't be tapped or traced. Maria nodded, pulling out her phone. I've installed an encrypted messaging app. Only you and I have the passcodes. We can't afford to leave any more trails for this person to follow. I downloaded the app, my fingers fumbling as I typed in the passcode. As much as I wanted to believe that Maria was on my side, doubt crept into my mind. Was I just handing her another tool to betray me? Or worse, could I be her next target? But time was running out, and we couldn't afford the luxury of mistrust. As much as I questioned everyone else, I had to believe in Maria. We had come too far to be derailed by suspicion. Our first lead came from an unlikely source. Kevin, the junior forensic analyst. He approached me cautiously, holding a sealed evidence bag. Detective Mercer, we've got something. The latest victim, Commissioner Hughes, was holding this in his hand, he said, showing me a small key. I looked closer. The key was old, with a peculiar insignia engraved into its bow, a set of scales. Where have I seen this before, I muttered, my thoughts racing back to previous cases, old investigations. Every shred of evidence that had ever passed through my hands. Wait, Maria interjected, her eyes widening in realization. The scales. It's the same insignia that was on a ring we found on the first victim. We thought it was a coincidence, but maybe it's a symbol. A clue. My heart pounded in my chest as the pieces started falling into place. That's it. This key. The ring. They could be the missing links, a clue to the killer's identity. But we need to figure out what this key opens and why the commissioner had it. As I pocketed the key, Maria suddenly seemed distracted, glancing at her watch. I've got to check on another lead. Talk later. Sure, I said, watching as she walked briskly away. 
It wasn't long after Maria left that my phone buzzed with a new message. This time it wasn't anonymous. Alex, it's urgent. Meet me at the old mill by the river. Don't tell anyone. It's a matter of life and death. The message was from Maria. My gut churned. Was this a trap? A test of my trust? There was only one way to find out. I sat in my car, parked a reasonable distance from the old mill by the river. The moon cast long shadows that seemed to dance in the wind, taunting the dark waters below. My fingers clenched the steering wheel, knuckles turning white. Am I walking into a trap? I whispered to myself. The thought weighed heavily, making it harder to take each step as I approached the mill. It was dilapidated, a relic from another era. The wooden boards creaked in the wind as if mourning their forgotten purpose. I took a deep breath, pulled my coat tighter against the chill, and ventured inside. The smell of rot and damp earth filled my nostrils, grounding me in the here and now. I flicked on my flashlight, scanning the cavernous interior. Broken machinery, long out of use, littered the space, forming monstrous silhouettes against the walls. It was like stepping into the belly of some long-forgotten beast. Maria? I called out, my voice bouncing off the walls, creating a chorus of haunting echoes. No answer. I moved deeper into the mill, each step echoing through the emptiness. I thought about Maria in the text. It's a matter of life and death. What did she know? Why here? Why now? My flashlight caught something metallic on the ground. A cell phone. I picked it up and, recognizing it as Maria's, felt a rush of adrenaline. Something was terribly wrong. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. The atmosphere had changed. I heard a soft rustle, a whisper of a sound that wasn't my own. I swung my flashlight around and froze. A figure stood at the edge of the light's reach, masked, indistinct, holding something sharp and gleaming. Detective Mercer, a voice taunted from behind the mask, so trusting, so noble, and yet so predictable. The figure lunged at me. My reflexes kicked in, pulling my gun from its holster, but the figure was quick, dodging my aim and slashing at me. The blade caught my arm, ripping through the fabric of my coat and drawing blood. I grunted, falling back, pain radiating from the wound. I scrambled to my feet, adrenaline overwhelming the pain. The figure circled me, like a predator playing with its food. You won't get away with this, I snarled, taking aim again. The figure laughed, a cold, cruel sound that filled the air. Oh, I think I will. The sound of a gunshot exploded, echoing through the mill. I expected pain, expected darkness to engulf me, but it never came. The figure staggered, clutching their side, and fell to the ground. I turned to find Maria, gun in hand, her face flushed with exertion and relief. Alex, are you okay? Thanks to you, I said, letting out a breath I didn't know I'd been holding. But how? Your phone was here. I thought you were the one in danger. Maria holstered her weapon, her eyes meeting mine. I dropped my phone on purpose. I suspected you were walking into a trap. I circled back to follow you. Had to make sure you weren't alone. As I looked down at the masked figure, now writhing in pain, I felt a wave of emotions. Relief, exhaustion, but mostly a newfound trust in Maria. Together, we had faced the darkness and emerged victorious. Yet one question lingered in the air like the smell of spent gunpowder. If this was the mole, the leak in our precinct, then who was the puppet master pulling the strings? The morning sun broke through the precinct's blinds, casting shadows on the walls like the bars of a prison cell. We had made it through the night, but at what cost? The figure at the mill was Officer Daniels, a rising star in the department, someone who had every reason not to be involved in this twisted game. Yet there he was, masked and armed, ready to kill me. I can't believe it was Daniels, Maria said, pacing in front of my desk. I mean, he was rookie of the year for fuck's sake. What could turn a guy like that? I sighed, massaging my temples. 
That's what we need to find out, Maria. Daniels was just a cog in the machine. There's someone else orchestrating all this. Maria's eyes narrowed. You mean the puppet master? Exactly. My phone buzzed, breaking the tension. A message flashed on the screen. Interrogation room two. Now. It was from Captain Thompson. We found ourselves staring at Daniels through the one-way mirror of the interrogation room. He looked beaten, a shadow of his former self, but there was something in his eyes, an unsettling emptiness. Captain Thompson joined us, his arms folded. IA wants to take over the interrogation, but I managed to buy us some time. If there's a chance to crack Daniels, it's now. Mercer, he trusts you. You're taking point. I nodded, squared my shoulders, and entered the room. The door clicked shut behind me, sealing us in a vacuum of tension. Daniels glanced up, a sardonic grin forming on his lips. Detective Mercer, to what do I owe the pleasure? I leaned in, my voice low and deliberate. Cut the shit, Daniels. Why did you do it? He chuckled. You think this is about me? Alex, you're looking at the strings, not the hands that pull them. Then tell me, who's pulling your strings? Daniels leaned back, a flicker of something dark crossing his eyes. If I tell you, they'll kill me. And if you don't, you're going down for multiple murders. You're cornered, Daniels. Start talking. For a moment he hesitated. Then, in a rush of words, he spilled it all. It's Detective Williams. He's the one running the show. He's got connections. Leverage on all of us. I had no choice, Alex. You have to believe me. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. Detective Williams, my mentor, the man who had taught me everything I knew about being a cop. It couldn't be, and yet. The door swung open and Maria rushed in, her face flushed. Alex, you need to see this. She handed me a piece of paper, a bank statement showing a large sum transferred to an offshore account, and the account holder's name, Alex Mercer. My heart sank. They're framing me, Maria nodded. And Williams knew you'd find out. That's why he sent Daniels after you, to tie up loose ends. I looked at Daniels, then back at Maria. We need to expose him, bring down this whole twisted operation before he brings us down. Daniels looked up, his eyes meeting mine. It's a dangerous game you're playing, Mercer. Be sure you're ready for the fallout. I nodded, a newfound resolve settling in. Oh, I'm ready. And when I pull the strings, the Puppet Master will have nowhere left to run. The precinct was abuzz, but not in the way you'd expect from a place dedicated to upholding the law. Whispers echoed in hallways, eyes darted, and trust seemed to have packed its bags and left town. Detective Williams was nowhere to be seen, and Daniels was under heavy guard. Maria and I had our work cut out for us. I sat at my desk, my eyes glued to the computer screen. Financial statements, phone records, correspondence, anything that could tie Williams to this nefarious plot. Maria was down in the archives, digging through old case files, looking for inconsistencies, anomalies, a crack in the persona Williams had so carefully crafted. My phone buzzed, breaking my concentration. It was a text from Maria. Meet me in interrogation room three. Bring the file on Williams. I grabbed the file and made my way down. The air felt thick, like walking through molasses. My hand gripped the doorknob, hesitated, and then I stepped in. Maria stood at the far end of the room, a projector set up. The wall was filled with snippets of evidence, connections, lines drawn like a spider's web. At the center was a picture of Detective Williams. I think we've got him, Maria said. Her voice tinged with a cocktail of emotions, triumph, disgust, and a certain kind of sadness. Look at this. She clicked a button, and the screen changed to a series of transactions, all leading back to an offshore account. Then another click, and emails popped up. Coded conversations, but the language was unmistakable. Deals, instructions, threats. The account Daniels mentioned, the emails, the coded messages, 
They all tie back to Williams, Maria declared. My mind raced. This is it. We have enough to bring him in. Maria turned off the projector, her eyes meeting mine. But we have to be careful, Alex. He's desperate, and a desperate man is unpredictable. I nodded. Agreed. We'll collect everything. Take it to Captain Thompson and IA and let them handle the arrest. No need for theatrics. It was all going according to plan, until it wasn't. My phone buzzed. A text from an unknown number. If you want to see this through, meet me where it all began. I showed Maria the text. It's him. Williams. Are you going? Maria asked, her eyes filled with concern. I hesitated, then nodded. Yes, this ends tonight. As I walked out of the precinct, every step seemed like a countdown. The place where it all began was clear to me. A rundown bar where Williams had taken me after my first successful bust. It was a rite of passage, an initiation into a darker world. The bar was as grim as I remembered, a place where hope came to die. I pushed open the door and walked in. And there he was, Detective Williams, sitting at the far end, a drink in his hand. Alex, he said, a smile crossing his face. So glad you could join me. I sat down across from him, my eyes never leaving his. This ends now, Williams. He laughed, a low rumbling sound that sent shivers down my spine. Oh, you have no idea. I felt the cold metal press against the back of my neck. My eyes widened, and I turned to see Maria holding a gun, her eyes filled with tears. I'm so sorry, Alex, she whispered. Before I could react, a loud bang echoed through the bar, but it wasn't Maria's gun. It was Williams, clutching his chest, falling to the ground. Behind him stood Captain Thompson, gun in hand, his face ashen. I've been tracking Williams for months, Thompson said, lowering his gun. I had my suspicions, but needed proof. Thank you for providing it. Maria collapsed into a chair, her face in her hands. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't. I looked at Williams, his lifeless eyes staring into nothingness, and felt a strange emptiness. The puppet master was dead, the strings cut. But at what cost? The precinct was an amalgamation of mixed emotions. Triumph, relief, confusion, and guilt buzzed through the air like static electricity. Williams was dead. The puppet master had finally been silenced. Captain Thompson received a commendation for his bravery, and Maria, after a thorough investigation, was cleared of all charges. Her last-minute hesitation had saved her career and my life. But the nagging feeling wouldn't leave me. The offshore account, the fake leads pointing to me, they were still out there, dark clouds on an otherwise sunny horizon. Thompson had assured me they were working on it, but I needed to act fast. Alex, got a minute? Thompson beckoned me into his office. Close the door. I sat down, anxiously awaiting what he had to say. Thompson leaned back in his chair, eyeing me carefully. Look, son, you've been through a lot. But the internal affairs are still sniffing around that offshore account tied to your name. We need to clear this up, and fast. I nodded, my jaw clenched. I'm aware, sir. I've been reviewing my old case notes, emails, anything that might give us a clue. I'm also considering bringing in Eva, a digital forensics expert we used in the Myers case. She's good, damn good. Thompson nodded approvingly. That's the spirit. Get her in here, see what she can find. The next day, Eva arrived. A whiz kid in her late twenties, Eva had a knack for seeing what others couldn't. Within hours, she had isolated a series of encrypted messages from the offshore account to a private server. Got something for you, Alex, she called me over, her eyes not leaving the screen. What is it? She pointed at the decrypted message on the screen. Finalize operation by midnight. Make sure all loose ends are tied up. W. My heart sank. This message was sent the day Williams died. He was going to frame me and leave no trace. He was the endgame. Eva looked up, her eyes meeting mine. 
We've got him, Alex. This is the evidence you need to clear your name. As I left the precinct that night, a strange sense of peace washed over me. It was as if the universe had conspired to give me this moment of respite. Maria was waiting for me in the parking lot, her face a mix of relief and exhaustion. We did it, Alex, she sighed, hugging me tightly. I hugged her back, my mind finally at ease. Yes, we did, but at what cost? Maria pulled back, looking at me. Sometimes the path to justice is littered with broken pieces. Our job is to pick them up and build something better. And as I drove back home that night, the city lights flashing by like fleeting moments of clarity, I knew she was right. The pieces were shattered, but they were still pieces of the truth. And in our line of work sometimes, that's all you have. Three weeks had passed since that night when the pieces of our shattered world began to realign. Thompson was planning a celebration to honor those who had worked tirelessly on this case. A morale booster, he called it. But I felt anything but boosted. As I walked into the precinct, I saw Maria sitting at her desk, her eyes glued to the screen. Something felt off. We had been through hell and back, but that moment, when she had her gun trained on me, still hung in the air. An unspoken tension. Maria... I began, pulling up a chair next to her. Can we talk? She looked up, her eyes meeting mine. Sure. We've been through a lot. Solved the case, cleared our names, but we haven't talked about... that night. Maria sighed, closing her laptop. I've been meaning to bring it up, too. I'm sorry, Alex. I let doubt cloud my judgment. When I pulled that gun on you, I was ready to throw away years of trust. Why? The question came out more abruptly than I intended. Maria hesitated before speaking. The evidence was piling up against you, Alex. I couldn't ignore it. In that moment, I thought I was doing my job. I thought I was protecting the precinct, the city, from another corrupt cop. I looked at her, trying to find a trace of deception, but all I saw was sincerity and regret. Do you trust me now? I asked. Maria's eyes softened. I never stopped Alex. That's what made it so hard. We sat in silence for a moment, the weight of unspoken words finally lifted. Come on. Maria finally broke the silence. Thompson's morale booster won't attend itself. As we walked into the gathering, amidst the clinking of glasses and muffled laughter, I realized that trust, once broken, takes time to rebuild. But we had time, and more importantly, we had each other. Flaws, mistakes, and all. It was a new beginning, one where unspoken words would no longer define us, but rather the actions we took to rise above them. Epilogue, New Horizons. Six months later, the precinct had regained some semblance of normality, or as normal as it could be given our line of work. Captain Thompson had been promoted, and Maria was leading a new task force, focusing on organized crime. As for me, I had received an offer to teach at the police academy, sharing my experiences to shape the next generation of cops. It was a new chapter for all of us. Maria and I met for coffee, a weekly ritual that had become our way of staying grounded. As we sat outside, the aroma of freshly brewed coffee mingling with the crisp autumn air, Maria looked up from her cup. You ever think about how different things could have been if we'd never solved the case or cleared your name? She asked. I took a sip of my coffee, contemplating her question. I do. But dwelling on what ifs doesn't change the now. We made it through, and that's what counts. Maria nodded, her eyes reflecting a newfound wisdom. You're right. We've got a future to look forward to. And as we went our separate ways that day, Stepping into new roles and facing new challenges, I felt grateful. Grateful for second chances, for the resilience of the human spirit, and for the opportunity to build something new from the broken pieces of the past. And that's where our story ends, not with a period, but with an ellipsis, because some stories are meant to keep unfolding, long after the last page is turned.